Welcome to everyone joining us today for what we promise will be an exciting and informative symposium. My name is Dr. Jordan Pinsker. I serve as the Vice President and Medical Director at Tandem Diabetes Care. Today's topic will be focused on patient selection in the era of advanced hybrid closed loop systems. Time will be set aside at the end for a question and answer session. Before we dive in, I would like to introduce Dr. Boris Kovachev. Dr. Kovachev is professor at the University of Virginia School of Medicine, adjunct professor at UVA School of Engineering and Applied Science, and the founding director of the UVA Center for Diabetes Technology. Currently, he is principal investigator of several projects dedicated to the development and testing of closed loop control and decision support systems for diabetes. Thank you, Steph, for the kind introduction and for the opportunity to present real-life and pivotal trial data for the Control IQ technology. Here are my disclosures. And let me begin with some distinct algorithmic features of the Control IQ Advanced Hybrid Closed Loop System. The hardware includes Tisley Max 2 insulin pump with the Control IQ algorithm on board. The sensor is Dexcom G6 that does not require finger stick calibration. The algorithm includes automated insulin correction boluses administered as needed in addition to basal rate modulation every five minutes. A dedicated hypoglycemia safety system attenuates smoothly insulin delivery to prevent hypoglycemia. A gradually intensified control overnight slides the algorithm target down to 110 120 mg per deciliter to achieve normal glycemia by the morning. There are exercise and sleep features and a web-based software updater. The International Diabetes Closed Loop Trial was a large study funded by the National Institutes of Health, which included two protocols that became pivotal trials for the control IQ technology. Protocol 3 was completed in 2019, recruited adults and adolescents ages 14 and older, and was run at seven clinical centers in the United States. Protocol 5 was completed in 2020. It was co-funded by Tandem Diabetes Care, recruited children ages 6 to 13, and was done at four centers in the U.S. The study coordination was by the JAPE Center for Health Research, both studies were randomized controlled trials and had two objectives. First, to assess the safety and efficacy of long-term use of control IQ as compared to sensor augmented pump. And second, to generate safety and efficacy data that satisfy FDA requirements. The inclusion and exclusion criteria of the two trials were rather simple. There were no entry restrictions for baseline A1C level Users of multiple daily injections were welcome. There was no need for prior CGM experience, and there were no restrictions for severe hypoglycemia or DK events. Protocol 3 randomized 168 participants, 2 to 1, to closed loop control versus sensor augmented pump. All 168 completed the six month duration of the study. Protocol 5 enrolled 101 children, randomized 3 to 1 to closed loop control versus sensor augmented pump. 100 children completed the four-month duration of the trial. The primary outcome in both studies was time in the target range 70 to 100 milligrams per deciliter as measured by continuous glucose monitoring. In protocol 3, at the baseline, the SAP and closed loop group had approximately the same time in range of about 60%, and that was retained by the SAP group during the 26 weeks of active observation. On closed loop control, the time in range went up to 71%, and that resulted in a highly statistically significant difference of plus 11% in favor of control IQ. Now, if we look at the time in range along the time of day. Here, we notice that the biggest difference between sensor augmented pump and closed loop control is overnight. And that difference has its largest amplitude 
around 6 to 8 o'clock in the morning, when the time in range on closed-loop control goes above 90%. This difference is directly explained by the design of the control algorithm, which slides the target down to 110 mg per deciliter overnight to achieve normal glycemia by the morning. Overall, the percent time in closed-loop control during this entire study was 92%. In children, we observe almost the same picture. The difference between the experimental and the control group at baseline is minimal, 2%. Then the experimental group improves by 14 percentage points to result in an adjusted difference of 11% in favor of control AQ. Similar picture is observed overnight as well the largest difference between sensor augmented pump and closed loop control is achieved overnight with time in range on closed loop peaking above 90% between 6 and 8 o'clock in the morning that again corresponds to the design of the control IQ algorithm. The percent time in closed loop mode spent by the children in this study was overall 93%. The two tables on this slide compare the results of the two pivotal trials in adolescents and adults ages 14 and up and in children ages 6 to 13. We can see that the improvement on closed loop control for the two studies was virtually identical. The time in the above 180 milligrams per deciliter was reduced by 10% here and here. The average glucose was reduced by 13 mg per deciliter here and here. A1C was reduced by 0.33% here and by 0.4% here. And the time below 70 mg per deciliter was reduced by 0.9% here and less prominently in children. Most of these comparisons yielded highly statistically significant results in favor of the control IQ system. For reference, these two trials were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. The adult adolescent trial was published in October 2019, and the child study was published in August 2020. As a result of these two studies, the FDA cleared the control IQ system for ages 14 and up in 2019 and for ages 6 years old and up in 2020. The system was authorized as the first interoperable automated insulin dosing controller designed to allow more choices for patients looking to customize their individual diabetes management device system. Now we move on with real-life control IQ data. A few months ago, my colleague Mark Breton and I published in Diabetes Technology and Therapeutics the data for over 9,400 control IQ users who had the system for one year and also had a two-week baseline. 99% of them had switched from basal IQ to control IQ, so the baseline data here is on basal IQ almost exclusively. 83% were with type 1 diabetes, the rest had type 2 or other forms of diabetes. The age range was really wide, 6 to 91 years old. 52% were female and the database contained over 1 billion CGM data points. This is one of the largest, if not the largest, database of real-life closed-loop control data published to date, and many analyses are possible, but I will begin with something simple. The time in closed-loop control, the time of system use. The violin charts presented here show the use of control IQ over time from day 14 to day 365 of observation and split by type of diabetes, type 1 versus type 2. It's easy to see that this time in closed loop, the median and its quartiles don't change over time 
and across types of diabetes. People simply stay consistently on the system for a year on their own without being part of a clinical trial. Let's move on with some more detailed analysis of time and range, split here by the categories of the baseline glucose management index used as a, an approximation for hemoglobin A1c. When GMI is below 6.5%, both basal IQ in the blue bars and control IQ in the red bars achieve time and range of 87-88%. But when baseline GMI moves up, the difference between basal IQ and control IQ increases to reach 22.3% for baseline GMI above 8.1%. This comes to show that while there is improvement in every GMI category, the people who did worse as the baseline improved most when switching from basal IQ to control IQ. Let's now look at the frequency of hypoglycemia as measured by CGM percent time below 70 mg per deciliter. The left chart splits the incidence of hypoglycemia by baseline categories of time below 70 mg per deciliter. The right chart splits time in range by the same categories of baseline hypoglycemia. We know that basal IQ is a low glucose suspense system and therefore is dedicated to preventing hypoglycemia. However, here we can see that control IQ still does better job preventing hypoglycemia, particularly for those who at baseline were at high risk, had more than 4% baseline time below 70 mg per deciliter. At the same time, uh, control IQ results in improved time in range across the board, across all these three categories, which comes to show that this reduction of hypoglycemia is accompanied here by simultaneous improvement in time in range. And that is most evident for those at high baseline risk. Let's look now at a bit more complicated scenario based on the recommendations from the International Consensus on Time and Range. The consensus brought us this picture, which says that for a treatment to be successful, the time and target range, 70 to 180 mg per deciliter, should be above 70%. Ancillary criteria include time below 70 mg per deciliter, that should be less than 4%, and less than 1% of that could be below 54 mg per deciliter. At the high end of the scale, the time above 180 should be less than 25%, and the less than 5% of that could be above 250 mg per deciliter. So if you look at our cohort of over 9,000 people at baseline of basal IQ, 36.6% met the criterion time and range above 70%. That percentage jumped 25 percentage points during the year of control IQ use to 61%. And if we take those who met the criterion time and range above 70% on control IQ, approximately 5,500 people, their mean time below 70 mg per deciliter was less than 2%, their mean time below 54 mg per deciliter was 0.3%, Mean time above 180 was 17.6% and mean time above 250 was less than 3%. So all of these criteria here, ancillary criteria, were met by this subcohort of 5,500 people. In addition, their average glucose management index was 6.7% and their average glucose was 142 milligrams per deciliter. And finally, I would like to put side by side the data from the two pivotal trials of control IQ and the data from one year real life use of this system. Time in range 70 to 180 milligrams per deciliter improved by 11% for adults and adolescents 14 years old and up. That's 2.6 hours per day. 11% for children 6 to 13 and 10% compared to basal IQ, 
during creolite use. Time above 180 mg per deciliter improved by 10, 10, and 9%. Mean glucose improved by 13, 13, and 12 mg per deciliter. HbA1c improved by 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and 0.3%. And the percent time in closed loop mode was also virtually identical, 92, 93, and 94%. This, this comes to show that the results from the two pivotal trials of control IQ translated almost perfectly to real life use. And last but not least, let me acknowledge our colleagues at the clinical centers who run the two pivotal trials of control IQ, NH and IDDK, for the support of our research, my colleagues at the University of Virginia, and of course, tandem diabetes care. As of June 2021, there were 270,000 people using a tandem system. And at the start of September, there were approximately 30 million patient days carried by the control IQ algorithm. So on this note, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kovacev. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Gregory Forlenza. Dr. Forlenza's research focus is on development, refinement, and testing of diabetes technology, including insulin pumps, continuous glucose monitors, and the artificial pancreas. He is interested in using technology to help patients better control their diabetes and reduce the burden of diabetes on children and their families. He is the primary investigator on several upcoming industry pivotal trials and co-investigator on several JDRF and NIH-funded projects. Hello, my name is Greg Ferlenza. I'm a pediatric endocrinologist at Barbara Davis Center in Denver, Colorado, and I'm very excited to be talking to you today about this topic, Rethinking Candidate Selection for Control IQ Hybrid Closed Loop Technology. These are my disclosures. So this is a topic that I've been thinking about a lot over the past couple of years, and I'm showing here information from an article that was published in Pediatric Diabetes earlier this year that I think really advanced the way I was thinking about this. I had nothing to do with this research other than just having read it, um, but I think this is a really interesting paper. And so this is a report of 192 Pediatric Endocrine Society members who prescribe insulin pump therapy to patients with type 1 diabetes. And what the authors looked at was the adherence to guidelines, eligibility criteria, and then objective and subjective factors that influence insulin pump prescription among pediatric endocrine society members. And what they found, I think, is really, really interesting, and it gets to a whole array of who uses technology, why some people use technology and don't, really focusing on the provider as the acting agent rather than the, the users, the patients and the families. And what they found was that 70 percent of the respondents uh, reported using personal guidelines as their way of deciding who should and should not be discussed, offered, and prescribed um, diabetes technologies. Only 22% reported using any form of written guidelines. And then as they kind of dug deeper with the respondents, the only standard objective criteria was glucose monitoring. And providers beyond that reported a whole array of personal factors that they considered, considered important. Lifestyle, risk for hypoglycemia, patient and family motivation was a big one. And I think the more and more we think about that, we can start to understand how that could be a big driver of some of the discrepancies we see in care. Um, and these are the important characteristics that providers described. Here they show a little bit of the um, data that they obtained, and you can see here the percentage of providers who coded these things as either um, very important or um, at least somewhat important. 
And what you see is patient and family motivation was the biggest one. Realistic expectations was after that. Ability to demonstrate carbohydrate counting, which we'll come to a few times here, um, was another one. The patient and family requesting it, meaning that they already had to kind of know about it and drive the conversation. That was up into the 80s in the percentages that said that. Um, their communication with the medical team, again, sort of the relationships they have with us rather than the relationships they have with each other. Um, the uh, physical ability to use the pump and then um, psychological, well, uh, uh, psychological wellness, um, previous adherence, coverage, um, and then psychosocial stability were some other big ones. But then number of people in the household, financial stability, and parental education were other factors in children. And I think these things are really, really interesting. And um, I would definitely recommend reading this paper, obviously, because I've chosen to highlight it. And so I talked to some of my colleagues about their criteria and I've reflected on my own. And here are some of the things that we kind of came up with as we were discussing this very informally. A big one that I heard was testing blood sugar four more times a day or wearing a CGM. Um, so that's kind of getting to an insulin pump or prior to using CGM, sort of already adhering to good glycemic monitoring, understanding carbohydrate counting. So again, already being skilled in how to dose carbs, bolusing three or more times a day, hemoglobin A1C under a certain threshold, 10% was the most common, but there were a variety of them, having diabetes more than six months or 12 months, and a certain level of knowledge, skill, education, or sophistication. And so my goal with these two cases that I'm gonna talk about here is to kind of shake those ideas up and make you question some of what your assumptions are, because these are two real kids that I work with and uh, they've shaken up some of my assumptions, which I think is a really good thing. So the first one is an 18-year-old male who I've seen uh, for five years. He's had type 1 diabetes for five years. And last year during COVID, these were both during COVID, just kind of temporally, um, he complained of being burned out on his diabetes while he was a senior in high school. Um, he'd used sensor augmented pump in the past and had used uh, basal IQ, so he was already a tandem user, um, but has intermittently used the CGM. His baseline control was actually really good for a 17, 18 year old male at 7.4%. And he said he was willing to wear the pump in the CGM, but he just didn't want to think about his diabetes. He didn't want to interact with it. He was going to take a gap year and work and wanted to just focus on his life and his friends and, you know, getting mentally ready for college and um, wanted to try the new system. So um, early last year, I ordered him a uh, control IQ, even though he'd kind of been declining in his um, bolusing behaviors. And here is his data. So this is what he was doing at his most recent follow-up visit with me about a month ago. And what we see here, for those who aren't familiar with the control IQ reports, is any time grams of carbs appears on the screen, that's where he entered a meal bolus. And anytime you see this little uh, droplet, that's where Control IQ gave an auto correction, but he didn't initiate that bolus. And then these are the, um, the insulin dosing determined by the algorithm, and the line is what the pre programmed rate would be. And so what we see here for this 18 year old male's uh, three days, the three days right before his visit, um, is that he gave one manual bolus of five grams of carbohydrates in three days. And the rest of the time, he was letting the system autocorrect him and wasn't interacting with it. He was eating normally um, for himself and was saying he was probably eating 60 to 80 grams of carbs per meal, maybe 40 grams other meals, and just wasn't interacting with the system. Um, it's important that I mention, I didn't instruct him to do this. Tandem obviously doesn't recommend that you do this. Um, I told him I was going to present this data at a meeting with the person who designed Control IQ. And so I'm interested to hear what Boris thinks of this. Um, and I told him I was presenting with the medical director. And it's interesting to hear what Jordan thinks of this. But this is not what we recommended. This is off-label use. But this is what he's achieving in the real world as an 18-year-old male who's decided he doesn't want to do what I've said to do. Here's another three days from that window where we see that I think he really bolused for about one meal kind of after he ate lunch today. And again, a second meal here, I guess, at dinner. Um, and then the rest of the time, he's just letting Control IQ um, handle everything on its own. 
And so this is what his modal day looks like for the two weeks prior to the visit. And you can see in the evening, he gets a little high. He has some amount of lows, but the rest of the time he's in target range and he's not interacting with his system. Here is his summary statistics. Average blood sugar 161, time and range of 70%, 1% lows. He's putting in carbohydrate bolusing amounts that result in about 2.5 units a day. The system's auto-bolusing him about 18.5, and his basal modulation is about 32, and 70% time in target range. And then here's his other summary data. He's putting an average of 11 grams of carbs into the system. As I said, he's eating about 60 to 80 grams of carbs per meal three times a day. And then here are the settings that he's using to achieve that. Um, it's important that I add, again, I didn't set these settings. This someone who's had diabetes for five years. He and his dad are very engaged, very active in tuning his system. They'll occasionally reach out to me for advice, but they've kind of entered the you know, more normal adult world of feeling very comfortable setting their settings. I don't know if they've deliberately tuned it this way um, to get no bolusing, if they found this on a blog or how they discovered it, but this is what he's achieving. And so as I review his settings, the first thing that I notice is that the system is delivering a basal of 32.41 units. And so the um, programmed basal is actually 25% higher than what the system is delivering. And I very rarely set pediatric patients where the program is actually higher than what is delivered. The total daily dose, if you kind of do our Avogadro's you know, numbers of endocrine, the 1800 rule says that his correction factor should um, be about 1 to 30. And for most of the day, he said his correction factor at 1 to 20. So it's about 50% more aggressive than I would calculate it should be. And I think this overtuning is probably helping him in achieving what he's trying to do. I didn't change it because he's only having 1% lows, but this is what he's done to get the system where he wants it to be. And then the insulin to carb ratio he's not even really using. So what are the summaries of this case? We have an 18 year old male with type one diabetes burnout using t X2 with control IQ. He's having excellent adherence with sensor wear and with wearing his pump. His settings appear overtuned, and I think that probably plays a role in how he's do, dealing with not bolusing. But he's achieving 75%, 70 percent time and range with less than one meal bolus a day. And again, I'm not endorsing this method. I just think it's fascinating as a discussion point because typically we would say someone who's not bolusing, not being on a pump, we wouldn't start on a pump. And here we see someone that's achieving goal control with a method that we would not normally start someone on a pump on. Here's my second case. 14-year-old male with type 1 diabetes of four years duration, really struggling with diabetes control and some depression during COVID. He's been home by himself like a lot of kids in the United States have been, and he just doesn't have the level of supervision that we want. He's on MDI and a blood sugar meter, so using no technology. His hemoglobin A1C during COVID has gone from 12.2% from 9.2% up to 12.2%. And he and his mother want him to have better control. They just don't feel like they have the tools to get there with injections and finger sticks. And so after a very long conversation with them, and again, I've known this family for four years, we decided to order Control IQ with uh, Dexcom G6. And again, meeting almost none of the criteria people would usually use for prescribing devices. Here's what this kid's doing now. This was his data over the summer at his last visit. And his mom works, so it's not like he had a higher level of parental supervision over the summer. What we see is that he's bolusing. He's bolusing for everything he eats. And this is his you know, blood sugar in range. We see he's had a couple of those one day, but most of the rest of the time his blood sugar's in range. You can see he's wearing his sensor. He's using his pump and he's interacting with it. Here's his modal day. Again, this kid's A1C was over 12 prior to starting Control IQ. And here we see his blood sugar control at his last visit after starting control IQ. And I still get chills every time I, uh, I look at this kid's data. His time and range has gone up to 74% with about 2% lows. He's bolusing for meals like we want to see. He's interacting with the system. His time in use is 91%. His average blood sugar is 148. His hemoglobin A1C at this visit came down from 12.2% 
to 7.9%. That is a reduction of 4.3%. We got data into the New England Journal of Medicine for this system showing 0.5 to 0.7% reductions in A1C. This kid's A1C came down by 4.3% starting control IQ. Here we see his data. He's getting bolus 7.4 times a day. Maybe about 20% of those are system and the rest he's doing. And we can see here he's entering his carbs, he's interacting with the system. So what's my summary of this case? 14 year old male in the United States, worst age for blood sugar control, worst age for kind of falling off the wagon in terms of blood sugar control. His A1C was 12.2%. We started him on control IQ and his A1C came down by 4.3% absolute or 54% relative. His time and range is now 74%. This was a kid that would not have met anyone's criteria for A1C, blood sugar tests, sensor use, boluses per day, family sophistication, the kid's on Medicaid, which is low-income government insurance in the United States, and just nailing it with diabetes control since starting the system. And this is kind of setting the grounds for what I hope we discuss here as a panel. Rather than waiting for patients to adhere to recommendations before prescribing technology, we can use technologies to drive success with meeting with expectations. When I saw uh, the second kid and his mother, they were effusive in their praise for how well this system worked. And you can see that giving someone a system which is easy to use, which works well, you see a very positive feed forward loop. Success begets success. They use the system, they have better blood sugar control, they have better blood sugar control, they feel more engaged with their care, they're succeeding, they, they wanna work harder then, and that keeps them succeeding. And so rather than you know feeling like they're failing all the time, they feel like they're succeeding all the time, and that drives more engagement. That's my theory on how we see these outcomes with patients like this. The TSLM X2 with Dexcom G6 is robust, easy to use and does a great job and my takeaway from all this is challenge your assumptions about who will do well with technology. Use technology to drive patients to do better with their care rather than waiting for them to earn it by doing well with their care in advance. As you can see this is a very exciting topic for me so thank you for listening. Thank you Dr. Forlenza. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Barnard Kelly. Dr. Barnard Kelly professor of health psychology, specializes in the psychosocial impact and management of illness and long-term conditions. Her long-standing research career spans models of healthcare, process evaluation, quality of life, psychosocial impact, functional health status, psychological burden, and their relationship with biomedical outcomes. Recently, Dr. Barnard Kelly was awarded FDA MDDT qualification for the Inspire Psychosocial Measures, the first such accolade for diabetes. Hello, I'm Catherine Barnard Kelly, and I'd like to talk to you about patient selection for hybrid closed loop systems. Here are my disclosures. So, the journey so far. There has been a wealth of evidence showing in recent years the introduction of multiple closure systems with RCTs as well as single arm studies of interventions of three or more months with participants across the ages from two years old right through to 75 and above. And in general, all of these systems have demonstrated improved biomedical outcomes. So, for example, time in range, reduced mean glucose, reduced time in hyperglycemia, improved A1C. We know also that there are some considerable patient reported outcome benefits on psychosocial functioning and quality of life that I'll come to a little later. So currently, the FDA have approved the Tandem T-Slim X2 insulin pump with control IQ technology and Medtronic devices 670G and 770G. We know the CE approval for other systems, and yet more systems are under review. However, we also know that health outcomes are shaped very much by socioeconomic status and ethnicity from childhood right through to end of life. And sadly, significant differences exist in diabetes technology use and access across 
parameters including socioeconomic, ethnicity and education, reflecting the need really for multi-level interventions to ensure that vulnerable communities are able to increase access to these devices that we know they benefit from. And I'll be showing you some data to support that statement shortly. So looking at the UK and the US, annual audit data consistently shows widening disparity in terms of access. And we know that children and adults from poorer or ethnic minority backgrounds are the least likely to be able to access diabetes technologies. And as I mentioned, patient reported outcomes, it's crucial to understand the impact on the lived experience of these devices alongside biomedical outcomes, because only by doing so will we know if a patient is willing and able to use that system in the context of their everyday life. And the FDA recognised themselves the importance of patient reported outcomes and improved the INSPIRE measures just last year. It's also really important to assess the readiness for technology adoption. And the technology acceptance measure by Corey Hood and his team is a very quick, very easy way to do that. So let's look at some data. The CLIO study, the Control IQ Observational Study, a single arm longitudinal study that evaluated real world use of the T-SLIM X2 insulin pump with control IQ technology in diverse groups of people with type 1 diabetes. And the aim was to evaluate sensor glycemic metrics and patient reported outcomes amongst participants after three months. So the sensor metrics are there, time in range, etc., time below range, time above range, and the patient reported outcomes, impact of diabetes profile, diabetes impact and device satisfaction, and an additional item assessing quality of sleep. And we know that sleep is so, so important. So, so let's look at some results. You can see here that there was a significant reduction in the impact of diabetes both overall and across several subdomains. So for example, freedom to eat as you wish, emotional well-being, flexibility around leisure activities, and relationships with family, friends, and peers. All very, very important to everyday life. Here we can see the diabetes impact on some of the important factors that people worry a lot about. So sleep comes up again, worrying about hypoglycemia, worrying about missing work or school, or the, the functions that we do as part of our everyday lives, irrespective of having diabetes or not. And you can see from the results here, between baseline and three month follow up, that there was a significant reduction in diabetes impact in all of these parameters, with a huge 32% improvement between that time period. Here we again look at device satisfaction in terms of some of the factors important to being able to use the device. So, helps me feel more in control of my diabetes. It can't be too complicated. It must be easy to use. It has to help in terms of glycemic outcomes. And you have to be able to trust the device. And as you can see again from the results, there is a significant improvement in device satisfaction from baseline to follow up with a huge 24% improvement. And here's the sleep question. I think this shows really clearly the huge benefit that being able to use the closed loop system was on people's sleep. Both sleep quality and quantity is hugely important. And 96% of study participants reported an improved sleep quality. There's nothing quite like being able to wake up in the morning, have to have had a good night's sleep and feel refreshed and ready to start the day.
So back to this issue around diversity. So you can see here across our cohort, black and African-American participants clearly benefit the most from the control IQ technology. And this benefit remained irrespective of controlling for age, gender, reported exercise and prior therapy. You can see the huge benefit that is seen here for this participant group as compared to the benefits seen in the other groups. And yet, as I said earlier, socioeconomic status and ethnic diversity is a, the biggest factor in terms of being able to access these technologies. Yet there is no clinical evidence to suggest that anybody benefits less in terms of outcomes, biomedical outcomes. So let's look at when people adopt the technology. So our earliest adopters, you can see in the gray line here, they start with improved glycemic control and it gets better. And this graph shows the time period six weeks before and six weeks after initiation of the closed loop technology. And you can see that on initiation of control IQ, everybody clearly benefits. So what would be interesting in future research is what is the additional benefit? What is happening here with the earliest adopters in terms maybe of behavior, setting, healthcare professional support, other important factors that set them apart from everybody else. That would be interesting to know. So here's some data on the children and teenagers group. We know that it's so important to ensure that children and young people have the skills and the devices necessary for optimal glycemic and quality of life outcomes to support them in transitioning through to adulthood where they're going to be solely responsible for their own diabetes self-management. And you can see here the correction factor, the 14 to 18 year olds saw the most benefit. So back to patient reported outcome data. This is data that we reported in a study a few years ago, but is still relevant today. It shows that closed loop has clear benefits for children and young people, as well as their parents, which reduce the burden and distress of man diabetes management. These include improved sleep, stable blood glucose levels, and feeling safe whilst using the device. But you can see also that reduced anxiety for parents about their child's diabetes. And here are some of the things that people said about why it mattered. Reassurance, perfect sugar control overnight, that sleep issue, that waking up with a good number, being able to rely on it, not having to worry so much. What about the hidden barriers though? Digital poverty, social inequality, the lack of universal access. Health literacy remains a big problem. It hasn't been helped by COVID and access to schools and education. The poor understanding of the systems and individual suitability. Julia Lawton from Edinburgh and her team have done a lot on healthcare professional unconscious bias both from insulin pump use to closed close loop use, and um, it exists, and as long as we're aware, we can address it. An awareness of availability of closed loop systems. So thinking about patient selection, what are the factors to consider when deciding whether a closed loop system is for you? Well, the first maybe obvious question is, what options have you explored? Why closed loop specifically? What do you think that it will do for you? Why is it that you want to move on to a closed loop system? How do you think it will help your diabetes self-management? What difference will that make to you, both in terms of glycemic outcomes 
and in terms of quality of life. And often diabetes is stated as a family disease. How will it impact on those that support you? But what about addressing the needs of healthcare professionals as well? And if COVID has shown us anything, it's that the burden on healthcare professionals has never been greater and there have never been higher levels of distress and burnout amongst healthcare professionals. So what outcomes are important when prescribing closed loop technologies? Because only by knowing which outcomes are important can the right therapy be prescribed. So is the only important outcome glycemic control? I would suggest not, obviously. <laughs> but think about what choices you are able to offer right now. Does the decision have to be made today or is more discussion needed? What constraints are you working under that limit your choices? And is there anything that can be done to alleviate those constraints? And we know that COVID could not be a bigger constraint. Who can support you and how best can that support be delivered? What are the training needs of your patient and how best can these be delivered? How best can these be met? Health literacy concerns, how can they be addressed? And that ever present question, how can you meet the needs of your patients whilst meeting the needs of payers and healthcare systems? So, to sum up, we know that healthcare professionals are facilitators of best care therapies. And we know that there is a large and ever-growing body of evidence that shows closed-loop systems have both glycemic and quality of life benefits, irrespective of age, ethnicity, socioeconomic status or duration of diabetes. So, equality of access is important but also so is tailored onboarding to really understand the needs of every individual patient by asking them questions around, what do you hope to get from the device? How will it impact you? How will it impact the other people that you love? What is AID closed loop therapy able to do for you? And the reality is that we know that closed loop systems do minimize diabetes burden, enabling users to live a life less dictated by a faulty pancreas. It's ultimately what we're all about. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Barnard Kelly. At this time, we will open it up for questions. Well, I would like to thank all of the speakers for their great talks. These are really fantastic presentations. And we'd like to review a few questions that have come in from the Q&A. The first question that's come in is specifically about uh, the cases presented by Dr. Forlenza. And a question that comes up all the time is, how often does a patient change pump settings or establish pump settings on their own? Are you comfortable with that? And what do you teach individuals, especially when they're using closed loop about adjusting their pump settings? Uh, there's a lot of great questions there. Thank you, uh, Jordan. So um, in pediatrics, we obviously adjust settings a lot more often than they do in the adult community, especially as we have kids kind of, you know, going through, you know, child growth and then uh, rapid uh, growth during adolescence and very high levels of insulin resistance during puberty, and then seeing that starting to level off and then come back down um, into early adulthood. Um, typically, we adjust settings every three months or so, but some patients, it's more more often than that. Um, regarding hybrid closed loop, um, we generally recommend that people contact us kind of initially. And then usually by the time people are around three to five 
years into their diabetes therapy is when they start to feel comfortable adjusting their settings themselves. For me, it's kind of a double-edged sword where I want people to feel empowered to make those changes themselves, but I also don't want them to feel unsupported in needing to make them themselves. So we typically are supportive of them making those changes, but with hybrid closed loop, obviously you have to do some relearning. And so the way you tune control IQ is going to be different than the way you tuned open loop. And we try and support them as they get to that change. Thank you. That, that's very helpful. Uh, the next question we have is about this theme of um, safety and that there, there's certainly a concern among medical providers that there's a, a concern that some individuals safety may be a limiting factor and the provider's perception of safety in prescribing insulin pumps in general, not even just closed loop. I'd like to ask Professor Barnard Kelly, Kath, if you could comment first, historically, you know, this has been a recurring theme and I think the data bears out how beneficial closed loop in particular can be. Could you comment on this? And in particular, um, both from the provider and the patient perspective? Yes, thank you, Jordan. Um, I think actually human beings are, are remarkably resilient at, um, at keeping themselves alive and, and doing what really is in their best interest to, um, to live the life and meet the priorities they need. I think our experience has been in all of the closed loop studies that we have done is that people feel very safe very quickly on the, um, on the closed loop and um, their, their prior concerns about trust and acceptability they, they fade away very, very quickly. So I think, um, yeah, I, th I think people, safety is, is less of a concern in reality because people are generally safe. Great, thank you. And then uh, for you and Dr. Forlenza, uh, a question has come in on the Q&A um, that talks about advice or um, what it takes to switch a patient directly from MDI to AID systems. And if we could ask, um, based on clinics, you know, your clinical experience and instructions you give in clinic, what instructions do you give uh, to those individuals, you know, especially around the time of start of the system? Yes, yeah, so that's a, a great question. Um, in our practice at Barbara Davis Center now, with the increased uh, availability of CGM in the United States, a lot of our patients are on MDI and CGM prior to starting um, CGM and a pump with hybrid closed loop. And so the way that we would set up something like Control IQ is very similar to the way we would have set up um, Open Loop um, Tandem in the past or Basal IQ in the past. Um, the training around what to do for hyperglycemia, what to do for what we call sick day management or um, possible infusion site failure, I think is the main element of training that's beneficial. And um, that I think is really helpful in terms of decreasing the incidence of DKA in um, pump users as compared to MDI users, especially with them wearing CGM. You know, they get the alert, they, they troubleshoot. We train them to give an injection as a fail safe, and that, you know, only takes up, you know, maybe 1% or 0.1% of the time, but helps avoid hospitalization that time. And then kind of the follow-up after they start it, we usually um, do a follow-up phone call about one to two weeks after they start it to tune the system again, and then at one month and then every three months. Um, and I usually tell people it takes about two weeks to get used to the new, and then after that, they are um, very happy with it. So about two weeks of transition, and then people do really well with it, as, uh, as Boris showed in his data. That's great. Thank you so much. So this is really a question for all three speakers, but Boris, I'll, I'll ask you to start, and it's really a two-part question. So first, what is the biggest benefit to control IQ technology that you've seen? Is it overnight control? Is it overall glycemic control? Is it improvements of quality of life or all the above? And then I think that the second part that I'd like to ask everyone is with all these barriers identified to technological use, how do we overcome these barriers? How do we get this technology that, that has proven so helpful into the hands of more individuals? So uh, Boris, maybe we could ask you to comment on what do you think the biggest benefit with Control IQ technology is? 
Yeah, I would tie the biggest benefits of control IQ technology to the design features of control IQ, to the unique design features of control IQ. You have an independent safety system that is solely responsible for controlling hypoglycemia, for minimizing the risk for hypoglycemia. So that's a glycemic benefit which translates into reduced fear of hypoglycemia and better quality of life. You have another feature which is intensifying control overnight with the objective to bring everybody to normal glycemia by the morning. So that's another feature that is directly translated in better night's sleep as reported by Dr. Barnard Kelly and better quality of life. And I'll stop here and give time to my colleagues to continue the answer. Thank you. Um, maybe, Kath, we can go to you next uh, for these two questions. Yeah, gosh. Um, so barriers to, to widening access. I think the barriers are, are really complex. So there are structural barriers in that clinical guidelines and regulatory approvals um, are generally based on RCTs and systematic reviews of trials that generally um, include early adopters who are not necessarily representative. So have the, the, you know, the, the same um, concerns as other people. I think people lack, um, in terms of uses and, and barriers, people sometimes lack an understanding that therapies are available. Um, there's obviously always a, a little bit of healthcare professional bias, but this can generally be overcome quite quickly. Um, and I think, I think people sometimes lack um, an appreciation of their rights to ask if a technology is available and, and initiate that conversation about suitability. So it's, it's, it's no single answer, I think. Um, Greg? Yeah, so um, I think, first of all, the, the best feature of Control IQ, um, you know, from a provider standpoint is that people get better control with less work. Um, and that, you know, Boris outlined, you know, how he, he achieved that and what they've done with this is, is amazing. Um, but, you know, what I always tell the patients is um, you're going to do less work than you did before and see better numbers. And they come back and usually both of those are true. And that's kind of the palpable benefit to the parent and the family um, or to the, the person. Uh, overcoming the barriers, uh, I think, providers right now are a big barrier. And I think a lot of us, you know, not the, our core group that, you know, technology meetings, but kind of in the broader field, you know, they think that technology is something you have to earn rather than use it to promote success. They still are afraid that, you know, people are going to do less or worse with technology than they do without it. And I think that a lot of their ideas haven't moved as quickly as the technology has. And, you know, that with factory calibrated CGMs, they don't appreciate that, like with the Dexcom G6, people will wear it and they'll get the data on their phone and they'll they'll learn from that. They they don't realize that with something like control IQ, if you get someone to just try it then they start waking up with normal numbers and they feel better. And they're like, oh, wow, this works. I mean, I've had people come back to me and be like, you know, this thing really works. And I'm like, yeah, that's why I told you for a year I wanted you to use it. So I think that's it is we need to get the providers to use the technology to drive better care rather than wait for people to earn it. Yeah, I just want to add that this is just the beginning. This is the first generation of Control IQ. We're just getting started. So hold on, <laughs> better <laughs> systems are coming. All right, I think that's a great closing comment. I wanna thank all of our speakers today and the audience for your great, great questions. Um, I think we've really highlighted uh, the benefits of improving access to care, some of the barriers that we need to overcome, and I think what, what Control IQ technology can do for your patients. So thank you all very much for attending.